Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Exodus. When, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt prepared for battle. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites saying, God will surely take notice of you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out for Sukkoth and from camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Contrary to popular assumption, we don't find or follow our calling in life by coming up with a strategic plan, carefully marking out our lives from point A to point Z and getting there methodically. You know, following and finding our calling has less to do with strategic planning as strategic faithfulness. We don't plan a call, we awaken to a call. Sometimes we awaken through the, the gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit or perhaps it was a sharp pull, or in my case, oftentimes it's a swift kick in the pants, but we awaken, we simply don't plan. Now, in the Christian tradition, there are really two known routes to uh, awaken to one's call. Um, one could be called the path of glory. Envision, for instance, Paul on the road to Damascus. The, the glory appears, light, and there's Jesus talking to him, and, and, and he's so full of joy and the spirit that he completely changes the course of his life and will, for the rest of his life, will endure hell and high water, never forgetting that taste of that love and grace that he experienced on that road. The path of glory. But the Christian tradition also knows another path, one that we often, maybe more often, find our calling within. It could be called the path of despair. <laughs> It's the path that Dante uh, knew when he wrote his Commedia. Uh, he says, you know, in the middle of the road of life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. Or to paraphrase the words of another favorite uh, philosopher, Woody Allen, uh, it often looks like this. Two roads lie before us. One leads to pain and suffering, the other to total annihilation. May God help us choose the right one. The path of despair. Well, in the end, if we find ourselves on the path, it really doesn't matter looking back whether it was the path of glory or the path of despair that awoken us to the path. Awakening is awakening. The path is the path. The moment that you realize that there is more to life than meets the eye for you. That you are as much a mystery to yourself as to anyone else. And that the mystery that is you longs for nothing higher than to connect with the mystery that is God. You are on your path. You've begun that journey. That's where it starts, and what keeps us on that path is a sense, a growing sense over time of God's presence, even amidst life's great uncertainties. Now, the word we may have for that sense of presence may not always be filled with God. We may simply experience that presence through things we might describe as, for instance, times of 
you know, those sweet spot moments where something just simply kind of clicks into place, where we sense a direction because it, we just know very subtly that that's the, the next step has been suggested for us or invited, we've been invited there. Uh, we may experience when we consider per, a particular course uh, almost like when a rubber ball is held under water and it, you know, it yearns for that surface. And so we may experience almost like there's something inside us has been set free to find air. You know, those aha moments, those rubber ball moments, those clicking into place moments. You know, we start to, to, to connect the dots between those moments. We realize there's a coherence there. There's something like a path there. And when we realize that we have been, we're invited into this amazing journey, it's both amazing and exciting and downright terrifying at the same time. I mean, what's amazing is that when we finally get a sense of invitation to that journey, it feels like a compliment we don't deserve. It's, it feels like it could take us places that we've scarcely imagined. Maybe privately we've hoped, but never seriously imagined. Of course, that's what terrifies us too, isn't it? We haven't imagined it. Certainly, we have never thought we were prepared for it. And so Moses at the burning bush says, hey, you know, I, I, I couldn't possibly do this. I, I'm not a good speaker. I stutter and all this. And, and Isaiah says, woe is to me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. Jeremiah says, oh, no, I'm too young for this. We all find our reasons. <laughs> oh, no, no, you certainly have way more faith in me than I deserve. It's terrifying. And it calls us, we can feel that call to step into the great unknown. But the wild thing about the sense of that call is that while intellectually we may go crazy, we may be highly stressed, we can tell that one of the signs that it's the Spirit calling us forward is that the source from which that invitation comes feels perfectly calm, perfectly at ease, not anxious at all about what it's asking you to do or where to go. Of course, why wouldn't it? God sees a bigger picture than we do. God has more information at God's disposal than we do. A higher power that is connected to past, present, and future who sees the, the amazing complexity of our relationships far better than that narrow band that, that we see surely is not worried about getting us from here to here because God sees more, knows more, and quite frankly, trusts more in us than we trust in ourselves. And God never figures that we're being invited to go someplace on our own, but rather we're being called to take a path, to take a journey with God's help, responding to God's continual guidance. So, it's about stepping into that great unknown, into that uncertainty with some trust, following that source of our ease and our joy. In fact, religion, when it comes down to it, does not do us a service when it promises us great certainty in life, a, a known path that can be just well charted out from point A to point Z if you only have, have faith. Now, have you ever noticed, in fact, that, that forms of religion that promise the most certainty, well, their adherents, the, the adherents of those forms are the most frenzied and hysterical? Isn't that a curious irony? The most certainty and yet, you know, I mean, let's face it, life is messy. And no amount of doctrine or dogma can solve that, even for a person of faith. Now, a faith that's built on certainty is like a house of cards that quickly falls when there's the slightest tremor at the foundation. And sure enough, today we feel quite a lot of tremors to the foundations of our awarenesses, don't we all? Um, faith collapses when it rests on uncertainty. 
Now, curiously, um, in the Bible, if you're going to read the Bible from cover to cover, what you find is, a, is the exact opposite of what you expect if you, if you listen to those voices of certainty in religion for long. You find that actually each and every person who's considered a hero of faith engaged mightily with uncertainty. And in fact, it was their faith that actually produced even greater uncertainty in their lives, uh, not less. If you look at Moses or Abraham or, and, or Sarah or, or King David in the Old Testament, or you know, it doesn't get just magically solved with Jesus in the New Testament. Look at Peter, look at Paul, look at Jesus himself. All of them had to develop a tremendous comfort level with uncertainty, and they were empowered to do it. No, in fact, in the Bible, the only people for whom certainty is a high value are the villains, the bad guys and girls. <laughs> They're the ones who crave certainty. Take our story for, from this morning, for instance. Take uh, Pharaoh. Pharaoh was not someone who merely preferred certainty to uncertainty. He strove for it with all his might. You know, Pharaoh had his five and 10 and 15 year building plan. You know, he had his point A to point Z and he was willing to exploit and oppress whole classes of people just to make sure that he could make his timetables and come in on budget, make sure he could do it all. So when Pharaoh is confronted by Moses with God's message, let my people go, Pharaoh doesn't simply say, oh great, you upset my plans? Well, no problem, it's God's will, so of course. Pharaoh resists mightily. This is a profound and unanticipated change of my plans. Um, and he continues to resist, so God continues to ratchet up the message to the point where it becomes kind of like that Woody Allen message. You have a choice of pain and struggle or total annihilation. Which do you choose? <laughs> Finally, Pharaoh chooses the path that God has set before him. But, you know, that story wasn't all over there, I think, in terms of this, our struggles with uncertainty or how, you know, seeing people. I think there's kind of an unwritten story in Exodus, one that you can infer from different points along the way. But imagine what it was like to be a slave. Uh, and Moses comes and says, hey, we're free. Let's go. Let's pack up. Let's go. Do you suppose all of them just simply said, oh, at last, let's go. Go where? Uh, there's a lot of desert out there. And any place that was arable and livable was already inhabited by all kinds of people who would not be particularly pleased at your arrival. Go where? Live how? It's a vast wilderness out there. Where is the food coming from? Where's the shelter coming from? For that matter, where's the direction coming from? <laughs> Now, life in Egypt as a slave would have been bad, no doubt about it. But also, can you just hear at least a few people saying, yeah, it's bad, but I know where I put my head at night. Yeah, it's bad, but I know where my next meal is coming from. Yeah, it's bad, but this is where I've always lived. This is where my family has always been. Yeah. That's, you know, those promises of the future, those are all unknown, and at least I know what I have here. It's a dangerous world out there. No, to be a slave, to have nothing, and be invited out into the wilderness, <laughs> it would have been probably felt, perceived by them, kind of like you can feel in this clip. Years ago, I was realizing, you know, if I were to come up with a screenplay of, of, of my own life, um, you know, every, you know, there'd be so much complete certainty and predictability in it. You know, every, every book I wrote would be a, a New York Times bestseller. Every sermon I preached would have you all in tears and rolling in the aisles, shouting hallelujahs. You know, my, my wife, all my jokes she would think were funny. 
Um, my kids would think I was like the coolest dad in the, in the whole world. Basically every challenge that I was ever faced with, I would be, enter perfectly calm knowing of my eventual success. And I realized, would I ever even want to watch a film like that? You know, even over my own life. I mean, I would get bored to tears, even of my own life. Well, what makes a film engaging for a viewer? Well, I asked that question this week to a filmmaker, a filmmaker named Scott Grissell. Scott Grissell just happens to be here this morning and just happens to have a microphone in his hand. So, what, Scott, why don't you just come on up? I, totally unexpected, of course. <laughs> So are you trying to say that Melanie doesn't think all your jokes are funny? <laughs> uh, that goes without saying. <laughs> Scott, uh, as, as some of you uh, may know, is the uh, producer of Darkwood Brew. Of course, he lives in Tucson, Arizona. And actually, you do a, a lot of things. You, you are a, b a busy person. I do. Um, you know, the, the cocktail party question, what do you do, is always a little terrifying to me because I, I know that... Um, uh, the answer will be longer than the people were expecting when they asked me that question. But um, my company is called Creatista, and uh, we do a number of things. One, one of the things that we do is some high-end commercial work, so I get on airplanes and go places and make commercials about cars and things like that. Um, we also do um, really something that's become a passion for me uh, more in recent years, um, a lot of just um, film, TV, and Internet uh, that is cast towards um, social service agencies, places that are doing good work in the world. So we're sort of able to take some of that commercial work that we do and some of that experience to AIDS organizations and helping um, people with pathways out of poverty and seeing what we can do to sort of intervene and get the message out about some of the homeless issues and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, for people. Um, I also am a commercial photographer, so um, those seem a little different, but actually there's a lot of similarity in the sort of filmmaking and the photography, particularly in that for me, um, I tend to take a narrative approach to photography, so I shoot a lot of people just like I would be doing if I was doing a film. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also, um, there's commercial photography and then stock photography. We have a, a portfolio, it's a growing portfolio of um, about 13,000 images, actually, <laughs> that, um, that we sell all around the world. I guarantee you've seen my stuff in magazines and, um, and here, yeah. actually. <laughs> no, I'll never I forget, about, about four years ago, um, you were at our house, and Melanie was asking you, what is stock right, photography? Right. And you just opened up a, 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 the Omaha World Herald to just point out what a stock photo was, and it turned out to be one of your photos. Right, yeah, I, <laughs> I said, uh, you know, I can open this magazine, I'll find a stock photo for you and show you what it is, and I opened it up and said, hey, that's one of mine, actually, yeah, so that's right. it's kind of fun. And then um, this crazy religious Christian media stuff that um, I do, which I owe a lot to my relationship with you over the years, so I've, I've done... Um, uh, some, of the, some of the first work that I did was with, with Eric, um, and now I produce Darkwood Brew here. I, I work with some of you are probably familiar with Living the Questions. I do quite a bit of work for Living the Questions on uh, many of their series post-production and, and sometimes production going out to interview people. Um, do that sort of thing. Um, uh, Center for Progressive Renewal, lots of other ones. Um, and United Church of Christ. And, yes, the UCC. So I've done uh, quite a bit of work over the years, both um, locally in the Southwest Conference, I'm, I'm from Tucson, and uh, for the national denomination as well. So. Yeah. so as a filmmaker, it's one of your, your, the things you do, um, what is it that makes a film particularly engaging? I have no idea. <laughs> Good. Actually, it's one tell of us the, about that. It, it's one of those things that's um, there's there's a certain uh, there's a certain magic to it, you know. I was, um, um, but the the thing that seems to be a, a throughput through through films that we like, and and to me this is both with um, with documentary and with narrative film. I think that there's the, this one piece which is kind of similar. It's that. When, when you walk into the theater or you push the button to have Netflix come up on your TV like I like to do, that, um, th that the first five minutes don't tell you the whole story. And I think we think of that probably in terms of plot twist, and that can happen both in a documentary and that can happen in a, a narrative film. If we, um, I, I think you were talking about having your life all worked out, which I think is great. <laughs> I wish I had mine all worked out. But that if, if you actually had that, it might be comforting, but it wouldn't be satisfying. Mm. And I, I think that's true with, with film. You know, one of the things that, that we try to do 
is to shake people up a little bit at kind of key points along the way and, and have those plot twists. You know, I, I, like, um, I like BBC mysteries, mm. so, um, so I'm a plot twist junkie. Because I know about every five minutes, whatever I thought was going on is going to turn out not to be what was going on. And that seems a lot like my life. Yeah, that's true. It seems like a lot of films, it was just kind of, you get one plot twist and you think, okay, well, that's what's going to solve it right. then. But then those are like the plot twist on the twist on right. the twist. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah I, think it, I think just historically, um, you know, because I studied film history, the, the idea, there, there was a point where there was kind of one plot twist. Mm. And um, it happened at a certain, you know, distance into the film and everybody went, wow. And I, I actually think now the fact that these, that we're really meandering, we're both, like I said, in documentary and in narrative film, probably has a lot to do with the fact that it really does mimic our lives. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, I don't really know, given the kind of work that I do, I'm not precisely sure what I'm going to be doing on Tuesday of this week. I know tomorrow I'm getting on an airplane and going home. When I get home, I don't know what that will be. And there will probably be a couple little plot twists for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when I get there, some things that I wasn't expecting. So. Yeah. So if we were to actually have watch a film of our own life, it may actually seem linear right. just watching the film, because time is linear, but really in any given moment, you know, there's all kinds of twists and turns, and that just seem, life seems very wide open. And, right. Yeah. I think um, you know. I think when we uh, when we watch a film, um, uh, I think about like Memento, which is a great mess up of things moving forward and backward in time. Um, and th there are other films like that that really um, sort of change our perception of how things how things move along. When we get to the end of the film. Maybe when we get to some point in our lives, whatever that point is, and we're looking back, we see that ribbon of throughput, which is very linear, right? Mm -hmm. But in the film, it's like, I didn't see that coming. Oh, mm -hmm. I didn't see that. I definitely didn't see that coming, and I really didn't see that coming. Yeah. And um, so looking ahead, you know, if I'm at some point in the film and I'm looking ahead, it's all branching. It could go here. It could go there. Yeah. And, uh, and uncertain. So if, this, if that kind of technique seems to replicate our lives um, more closely than before, um, does, have you found that in your own experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, well, uh, you, uh, other than the fact that I've been completely certain about every step that I've ever <laughs> taken, and it's worked out exactly the way that I intended for it to, so, um, which has never happened to me. So. Um, I, you know, um, given the, the kind of work that I do and the sort of person I am, I'm actually fairly comfortable with uncertainty. I mean, I've done this for a while now, kind of stepping out, again, not knowing what Tuesday might bring. Mm -hmm. So um, I can think of one example in particular of that, which was about a decade ago, um, I formed a company with a couple partners. And um, they were good people, people I had worked with in various ways. They each brought something to the table. And so we built, a, we built a company, we hired employees, we had a place, we had all this, and we took that company apart in a year because some of the things between the partners just didn't really work out amongst these good people. And that was probably one of the most, pain, definitely the most painful professional experience of my life and probably ranks up with being one of just the most painful experiences of my life. I think I heard you reflect on that once, saying you wouldn't wish the experience on your enemy. <laughs> That's right. I actually wouldn't wish the experience on the partners that we were pulling <laughs> apart from. But I'm glad I had it for myself. So I, I wouldn't want somebody to have to go through that. But it was formative for me, as difficult as it was. Um, as much as anything, sort of learning, you know, five things that I would never do again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was part of it. But um, we entered into that. You know, I was thinking about the people walking in the wilderness, and you know, the the, the pillar was there. And I, I even think for me that there was a sense of calling in this in this company that the that the pillar was there. And I feel a little bit like these people sort of walking in the wilderness during the daytime, and the pillar is a fuzzy cloud. You know, I thought I was sure. The pillar was a little amorphous. I knew it was there. It was always there, and I was following it. It just turned out to be my expectations about where the pillar was leading mm. were completely wrong. <laughs> and, and part of that was because you and I had started talking about the time that we were forming the company, give or take. You and I had started talking about this walk, right. which I'm sure people are familiar with. And um, we said, we need to document this. People need to see this happen. Well, as, as I was forming the company. For those of you who might be first time visitors, that was a walk across the country in 2006. 
Yes, to bring a message of um, inclusion and compassion, a uh, Christian message from Phoenix to Washington, D.C. So a five-month walk across the country, and I did a documentary about that film. At that time, I, I just knew that was going to happen, but I was also, Eric, Eric, I'm putting this company together. I, you know, I can, I can be there sometimes. I can send some people to do it, but I can't necessarily be there. And, and clearly the pillar... Um, had other ideas as the, the company that I put together as we started to take that apart and that became clear. The one thing that did become clear is that cloudy, so I was in the daylight and that cloudy amorphous pillar turned into I was in the dark because it was a very painful time for me, but what I needed to do was becoming very clear. And what I needed to do at that point was make the film and be with you and with the group of people who are walking across the country for that entire process. Mm. So it went from cloud to fire. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, from sort of like amorphous to explosion, yeah. so. Right. Yeah, so um, you, you got on the walk and became the filmmaker for that. And, I did. And, and documented how a group of Christians can have the, a, a great sense of call from God and walk from Phoenix to DC and everything just goes great. Yeah, and yeah. we learned way more about each other than we probably ought to know. So. <laughs> this is true, too. Um, so I'm counting you to just not say a whole lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I'll show a certain amount of discretion. How's That's that? Right. So, um, so uh, as you can imagine, with people who spent five months walking across the country, there, were, um, uh, there are points where it becomes very difficult um, for, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, I think we're going to look at a clip which comes from about halfway into this film. So, um, so right now, think about um, people who are, who are, they have left Phoenix fairly sure of their mission. They're about halfway through. We're in St. Louis at this point. And everybody says, we need to have a meeting because emotionally, we're in the ditch here, really. And... Um, so at this point, Eden Seminary, which is in St. Louis, um, everybody's going to get together and just kind of talk. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I had, as part of uh, agreeing to do the documentary about this walk, I said, you know, I need access to what you're, you're doing. So that as this meeting was coming together, um, you know, we came in with the cameras, and there was at least one person who gave me a very crosswise look. You know, it's like, this is going to be pretty personal stuff. And I said, yeah, I know, that's why we're here. So, um, so um, I think we should, we should take a look at okay. that and then um, just pay attention to some of the language because we're going to look at something that happened then later in the walk in a second and compare sort of where some energy shifted. All right, so. well, pay attention to language, but uh, you, you also <laughs> chose the clip where it's the one time in my life I ever swore. I, I swear, it was my only once. I that's just not captured true. it. Uh, on film, so there is some langu other language just to just ignore from your minister. <laughs> Here it is. I keep saying to myself, it's, it's, it's you know, so many more weeks, that's all it is. We can do this. By the 12th week of the walk, some of the physical and mental wear and tear on the walkers was really showing. Uh-oh, it's only this many more weeks. I don't know where the money comes from this fall, and I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm just kind of saying, okay, I miss Being around people my own age, and I love all of you guys, but it's, it's really hard for me. I, I don't really know who I am, and I'm trying really hard to figure out what I'm doing and um, who I am and who I want to be. I think on Friday, if, if each of you said, you know what, Eric, this walk was just total bullshit, I would say, my God. You're right. Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Derek, I can assure you this walk is not bullshit. Even the walks that I was on, that were bullshit, they were not bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Several people said to me, you know, people are getting stressed out, we need to talk this through. And I thought to myself, well, if everyone else needs a meeting, we'll have one. I have never once doubted this should be done. I have every moment doubted how this should be done. And I needed this meeting more than anyone else. I realized I had all this pent up stress and emotion. So we were still worrying about our event. We were still worrying about money. I think we'll have enough money. So I think um, part, of the, part of the energy um, and, and what was happening, you hear a lot of people saying, I don't know, I doubt, I'm not sure. 
Um, and again, people who left fully with that sort of pillar of fire in front of them. And I, I'm not sure that anybody at that point would have said, well, the pillar of fire isn't there, the, maybe the, the cloud. May, and maybe people felt that. I can't quite be inside their head to know that. But I do know that I think of the, of the six core walkers, the people who were there, if two of them at that point had said, let's just throw in the towel and go home, the, the entire thing, that was the moment, the pivotal moment, it would have dissolved. And it would, I, I think at that point it would have been a done deal. I mean, I think it would have been finished. And, um, but, but clearly in the, in the doubt and the un uncertainty, um, the good thing that happened was that this group did sort of, instead of kind of pulling away from the, the, what, the unknown, um, they leaned into the unknown. I mean, they walked out of this saying, yeah, we, we don't know where we're going, but we need to do this. So we have a, another clip which comes from, this is in, uh, this actually is in Washington, D.C., and it's, the, it's at the end, and it's kind of a series of little clips, but I picked the same people who were talking from the meeting in St. Louis so you can compare the language shift for people who now, like we were talking about, they've gotten to a point where they can look back and see the linear path versus sitting in St. Louis when all they saw was the am amorphous and unknown. So. You're a uh, man there. It's like David. Oh, oh. And you can come up on the pond, the areas. We are sorry that our silence has allowed fear and narrow-mindedness to drown out the voice of Jesus. I followed this dream and my feet fell into step. Far too often we are told the voices which try to separate us and exclude people of different races, classes, or creeds from our national psyche are speaking on behalf of God. Those voices do no such thing. Amen. As Christians in America, we really stand at a crossroads. We could either choose to continue to walk in the path of fear and intolerance, the path advocated and practiced by many church leaders these days, or we can choose a new path, the path of love, the path of Jesus. There's a saying, leap and the next will appear. So I left. So, so in that, um, and that would have been two months later, two and a half months later, something like that. So um, you hear now Katrina talking about a dream and I followed my, you know, my feet followed steps. You're talking about um, being at a crossroads and being the walk continuing. So the, so the language of not knowing if it was total bleep mm -hmm. versus you know, now being confident that we've done something good and mm -hmm. that the walk needs to continue. And, and Megan talking about, you know, she says leap and the net will appear. Um, she actually, after this, ha had no knowledge of this before she started, but she went to seminary and now she's an ordained UCC minister yeah. in, in Seattle. Um, and, and the thing that was, um, was critical to me in that sort of, maybe that's a plot twist from Eden to, and I think it was certainly a life twist for people because I don't think the people in Eden were seeing where they would be personally in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. And I don't think that they necessarily saw what that would spin off for, you know, for a lot of the other people yeah. along the way. So big shift. Yeah, no, that, that first was painful even now, <laughs> this many years later to see that, but I think that what, what did actually move us out and did not end that walk was that the pillar of fire was still mm -hmm. very much there, that passion, that sense of call. Um, and uh, it really kind of, both on that walk, as in your life, as in the life of Israel, confirmed that, you know, uh, certain, Brian McLaren's statement, certainty is uh, overrated, <laughs> that um, what we really are uh, about is a relationship. What uncertainty does is it moves us into a relationship with God and you know, that, that we have to choose then uncertainty in order to be into that relationship. But the reminder also is always that God has made the same choice with, in being in relationship with us, that in creating us, God had to say, well, certainty isn't all I need either, that I prefer to be in uncertainty with these, these people. And so that pillar, that cloud, is, is always there even when we <laughs> might want to give up on it. There's that wonderful quote I love from, uh, uh, from uh, John Ortberg who once said, you know, we, we all think we want certainty, but we don't. What we really want is trust wisely placed. 
Trust is better than certainty because it honors the freedom of persons and makes possible growth and intimacy that certainty alone could never produce. And certainly it is that trust, a sense of following those moments, those awakening moments that seem to exist like breadcrumbs in the dark wood of life, leading us on a path that leads us over and over again to envision and follow a vision that takes us places that we would never imagine going ourselves. Well, thank you, Scott, for, uh, right. for thank you. Uh, being part of this journey with us this morning. Great. Thanks. Very good to be here.